When the legendary director Peter Bogdanovich arrived in Hollywood in the mid-60s, he forged relationships with some of Hollywood's directing titans, Howard Hawks, John Ford, and Orson Welles, among others. And from the best, he learned his craft. In his incomparable career, he's experienced the height of success and the depth of tragedy. The last picture show made 40 years ago is still heralded as a masterpiece. His other films include What's Up Doc, Paper Moon, They All Laughed, Saint Jack, and the critically acclaimed and box office success, Mask. He has been at the center of a very important chapter of film history, and he continues to inspire a new generation of directors. And tonight, Academy Award nominee Peter Bogdanovich shares some of his most private thoughts here on The Steve Mason Show. Peter, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for asking me. I want to jump right in with my favorite film of all time. It is right there. What's up, Doc? One of the funniest movies ever made. Well, thank you. That was the only film I ever made on a dare. Yeah, explain that. Well, the head of the studio said, offered me a picture to do with Barbara Streisand, and she had seen the last picture show, which hadn't opened yet, but she'd seen an early screening of it, and she wanted to work with me. And the script they sent me from Warner Brothers, I didn't like, so I said, I don't want to do this. So the, John Callie was the head of the studio. I, he called me into a meeting, and he said, look, if you had to make a picture with Barbara Streisand, what would you do? Oh, I said, oh, I'll do a screwball comedy. Like what? Well, you know, bringing up babies, square professor, nutty dame, she screws everything up, a happy ending. Do it. What are you doing? This is a one-way street. We're already going one way. Ah! 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 I am looking out. He said, yeah, who would you get to write it? And I said, well, I used to work at Esquire with Denton and Newman. And he said, they just, just finished a picture for us. Do it with them. So I left the office of my third picture, producing and directing Streisand's next picture, which nobody knew what it was going to be. Bob Benton and David Newman came out, and we worked for three weeks. They only had three weeks. Then I rewrote it in about a week, and then we got the actors together, and it wasn't really great. My trick was getting the actors to read it with me, figuring that they'd be wanting to impress me. They wouldn't notice the script needed work, and it worked. So they agreed to do it. And John Callie called me and said, the script needs a little work, don't you think? I said, yeah. He says, how about we get Buck Henry? I said, great. Had one meeting with Buck, and he did the script we shot. You know, I saw it recently. Holds up incredibly well. It contains, you know, a, a woman I think is an underappreciated genius, Madeline Kahn. And this was technically her first feature film. Yeah, we introduced her in it. I never saw her before in my life. What did you see in her? She was funny. She wasn't trying to be funny. I went to New York to do some casting. The casting woman, Nessa Himes, brought her in to see me. And I just sat and talked with her, and I started laughing. She says, what are you laughing at? She says, you're funny. She says, I am? She just, I mean, she just had that voice, and she had a way of delivery. But she didn't think she was funny. She didn't think she was funny? No. She didn't know why people laughed. We had a table reading, and she'd say, Howard, and everybody would fall apart. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara was not thrilled. <laughs> I, I love the line, I am not a Eunice Burns. I am the Eunice Burns. I would argue that nobody could have delivered that line with as much punch as Madeline Kahn She did. was great. When the picture opened at the Radio City Music Hall, 6,500 people, you know, she went to see it and everybody was laughing at her and she went into therapy. Really? Yeah, she said she went into therapy. I'll tell you a funny story, though, about that. When I heard that the picture was going to open at the Music Hall, which was the premier showcase for pictures that the kids could go see, yep. I called Carrie Grant, who was a friend of mine, and I said, guess what, Carrie? My new picture's opening at the Radio City Music Hall. He said, oh, that's nice. I had 23, 28 pictures play the hall. I said, 28 pictures? Yeah, and all my pictures play the music hall. I'll tell you what you must do. When it opens, go down there and stand in the back. And put on a raincoat and some sunglasses. Well, you won't, you won't need that, but stand in the back and listen and you watch while 6,500 people laugh at something you did. It will do your heart good. <laughs> and I did, and it was the greatest uh, 
viewing of a picture of mine that I ever experienced. Wow. Your father was a painter. My father was a great painter, and I grew up, he painted at the apartment. I mean, he painted there. He had a studio in the same place we lived. So uh, I grew up with paintings and composition and color, and, and he took me to museums and galleries when I was very young, and took me to the Museum of Modern Art to see silent movies. My father was 20 years older than my mother, so he grew up with silent films. He was 30 when sound came in, hmm. so silent films were the foundation of the medium as far as he was concerned. He taught me that. And then years later, you began programming film for the Museum of Modern Art? I did York. that in the, yeah, when I needed a gig between t directing plays. I directed a play when I was 20 in New York. Wow. That was a coincidence. I wrote a program note about an Orson Welles film I liked called Othello, which I had the temerity to say was the greatest Shakespeare film ever made. Hmm. And this was not the common wisdom at the time. The head of the M museum uh, film library, Dick Griffith, calls me and says, we're going to do the first American retrospective of Orson Welles. We'd like you to write the accompanying monograph. I said, why me? Usually you I was 21 years old. I said, why, why me? Usually you do it. Well, I don't like Orson Welles, he says, but, uh, <laughs> but we have a lot of members who do, and we think it's right for the museum to do it, but we want somebody who's partisan, and you clearly are. We read your program note. And that's how I got that good job, 50 bucks. Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks to arrange the entire show and write the monograph. How did that's how I met Orson. Though. That's how you met, I was just going to ask, how you met Orson Welles. Seven years later. I sent the monograph to him somewhere in Europe where he was shooting. And seven years later, I now was married, had a child, had directed a movie, Targets, my first film. And I get a phone call. And I speak to Peter Bogdanovich, speaking. Hello, this is Orson Welles. Hello. I can't tell you how long I've wanted to meet you, he says to me. I said, wait a minute, that's my line. <laughs> he said, I said, why do you want to meet me? He said, because you have written the truest words ever published about me. Pause. In English. <laughs> <laughs> he had great humility, didn't he? So we met ne the next day at the Polo Lounge, and we became friends. You've written, obviously, a great deal about uh, Orson Welles. You've written a lot about... Citizen Kane. For you, what makes Citizen Kane one of the great films ever made? Well, I suppose it's the extraordinary technique, uh, the way it's made. First of all, his performance is extraordinary, going from 25 to 85. But just the, the, the way it's told, the storytelling, the freedom with which he tells it is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, it's probably the most pessimistic movie ever made. Everything is, burns and goes to hell at the end. And yet the picture is so made with such panache and with such uh, exuberance in terms of technique and style and so on that it, it is this extraordinary tension between the pessimistic nature of the material and the optimistic nature with which it's told. So it's an interesting, interesting uh, tension there. The use of deep focus in that film is of incredible a claim. But Greg Toland, had, his cameraman, had been experimenting with it. The idea that you could see everything in the frame sharp. I liked that. I asked Orson why he wanted that. He said, well, he said, the eye sees everything that way. I don't see why we shouldn't see it that way on the screen. And I've emulated that. Where did you use that? Technique? Well, I use it as much as possible in all my pictures. I hate anything out of focus. So you're always cleaning that up? Always trying to clean that up, yeah. yeah even in color, which is hard to do. In fact, matter of fact, when I was making the last picture show, I said to Wells, we were having breakfast, and I said, you know, I want to get that deep focus quality you had in Citizen Kane and Touch of Evil. You'll never get it in color. I said, well, you know, they have faster film now. Maybe you could, you'll never get it in color. Well, I don't know, why, why don't you shoot it in black and white? Well, I don't know if they'd let me. Well, have you asked? <laughs> well, no. Well, why don't you ask? And you know what I say about black and white. No, what? It's the actor's friend. Why do you say that? Because every performance looks better in black and white. <laughs> Name me a great performance in color. I defy you. Well, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> and, and last picture show was shot in black and white. Yeah, and he was right. It, it, it's a great medium. And Reed High School, we love you. And we'll fight for you. It's been 40 years since the last picture show. Does it feel like it's been 40 years since that film? No. No, it doesn't. Still 
you know, a masterpiece to this day. A lot of people looked at that novel and said, I, we don't, I don't see a movie there. How did you find the movie in that novel? Well, first of all, a very good friend of mine, Sal Mineo, an actor, a dear friend of mine, gave me the book and said, you ought to read this. I always wanted to play the lead, but I'm too old now. So I read it, and uh, first thing I thought was, I don't know how you do this as a picture. I'm always very inspired by the challenge of how do you do something. There's a number of pictures I've done where I just didn't know how to do it, so I did it to find out how to do it. Sure. Well, I thought a lot about it, and I thought, well, the only way to do it is to do the book. Just do the book. It goes from one football season to the next. Obviously, there's too much in there, but to cut, cut some stuff out. But basically, follow the book. Eight Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay. And you got two Academy Award-winning performances. Yeah, four from... nominated and two got them. Exactly. Do you know a great performance when you're seeing it on the set? Sometimes you do. You, 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 you should get better. Otherwise, you should be taking and doing another take. Uh, but I remember the last scene with Cloris Leachman. Uh, this is a true story, even though it sounds made up. <laughs> I, I said to her that she was going to win an Oscar for this. She said, why do you say that? I said, I just have a feeling you have uh, been around a while and you haven't had a part. This is the part. So after every scene, she'd say, do you think that was an Oscar? Was that really? After every scene? Almost every scene, she'd say, wow, wow was that the Oscar? I said, comes to the last scene that she did, and I don't, know if, I, don't, I don't know if it was the last scene we did with her, but it was the last scene in the picture when she throws the coffee and yells at the kid. She had come to me and said, can I rehearse that scene with you? And I said, no. She said, I want to show you how I'm going to do it. I said, I don't want to see it. Why not? Because I don't want to see it until you do it in front of the camera. What am I doing apologizing to you? Why am I always apologizing to you, you little bastard? Three months I've been apologizing to you without you even being here. So when she did it for me with the camera, that was the first take. And that's what's in the picture. And she said, I can do it better. I said, no, you can't. You just won the Oscar. Really? Yeah. Because that last scene was powerful. She to this that. day, she's, every time I see her, she says, I could have done it better. <laughs> <laughs> you won the Oscar. What do you want? <laughs> You, uh, you fell in love with your leading lady. Oh, yes. An Civil Shepherd uh, in the last picture. Uh, occupational hazard. Why does that dynamic exist? I said to her at uh, one point prior to the liaison beginning, I said, I don't know who I want to sleep with more, you or the character. <laughs> she, she got red in the face. <laughs> and I, I couldn't actually answer that question, but it, they merged, and uh, it was overwhelming. It was sad because I had a pretty good marriage going, but uh, this was overwhelming. Is this something that's unique to you, or are directors prone to falling in love with their well, leading it's a, ladies? Well, it's, 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 it's as I say, it's an occupational hazard. Actors falling in love with actors when they have love scenes, you know, you, get, you start thinking it's love, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just passion. But with Sybil and I, we, we really fell in love with each other, and uh, we lasted quite a long time. I saw her, I had dinner with her last night. Yeah. We're still very good friends. Could you make a movie like The Last Picture Show today, in this climate, in Hollywood? Well, it could be made, but not, not with a major studio and not with the major studio backing that we had. Don't forget, that was a picture that cost a million and three. Wow. And Columbia put it out, you know, like an important feature. They didn't say, well, it only cost a million three, why should we spend any money promoting it? I mean, that, that's such idiotic thinking in my mind. If it's good, it doesn't matter what it costs. The audience doesn't check to see what it costs. You could make it today, but with great, much greater difficulty. And it would cost more because of inflation and so on. But um, it could be made, but it would be difficult to get it made. Because, you see, what's happened is that in the 40s and 50s, for example, the so-called B picture, this low-budget B picture, was usually a science fiction action adventure. Not a star piece. The A pictures in those years were about people, like From Here to Eternity or How Green Was My Valley. Today, the A pictures are the B pictures of old. Today, it's the A pictures of science fiction, superheroes. The B pictures now are the ones about people, which you can't get made. It's screwed. So, do you think the business is healthy? No. It's, it's terribly decadent. 
I mean, what, what is this fascination with, with, with comic books, with comic book heroes? I mean, what are we, kids? I guess we are. It's made for 13-year-olds. And what about the delivery? In other words, people watching movies on their iPad or their iPhone. Is that still watching a movie for you? No. Watching a movie, I mean, you have to say that watching a movie on television is acceptable because you have no choice. Some movies you can't see any other way. But the proper way to see a movie is on the big screen with an audience in the dark. The film, you can't pause it. You, it's inexorable. That's the right way a movie should be seen. And it's that communal experience. Well, I think it is the communal experience. It's very, very important. You're sitting in the dark with a bunch of strangers, and you're all laughing at the same thing. It's a wonderful thing. You met Roger Corman at a unique time in your career. You had yet to direct a film. You directed plays, but you hadn't directed a film yet, right? Right. I had directed five or six plays in New York, but I hadn't done a movie. And I moved to California. I was writing quite a lot of feature pieces for Esquire, when Esquire was the, the magazine. So I used some money from the pieces to move to California with the express purpose of getting into movies somehow. And a, exactly a year, almost to the day that we moved there, I went to a performance at a theater of a movie, French movie called Bay of Angels, directed by uh, Jacques Demy, I think. And seated, seated behind me was somebody whom I knew, and he was with Roger Corman. And somebody with me knew the other guy or something. And suddenly we were introduced, and Roger said, I read, I've read your stuff in, in Esquire. Do you, do you want to write for movies? I said, yeah. And that's how it started. Would it have happened had you not met Roger? Maybe not as quickly. Roger was great. I mean, he was responsible for the careers of many, 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 many people. The whole New Hollywood essentially started with Roger. In fact, the New Hollywood movies started with Roger, with The Wild Angels, 66, preceded Bonnie and Clyde by a year. Hmm. It was the real first off-Hollywood Hollywood movie, and uh, I worked on that with him. And uh, it was a great experience working with Roger. He's, he's a real guerrilla filmmaker, you know. And he's still out there still making guerrilla movies to this day. To this day, yeah. You know, I came across your first movie, Targets. And that's one that really gets under your skin. You know, Boris Karloff is... How did that project come together? There's a sniper, there's Boris Karloff, there's a drive-in movie theater. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It's a little crazy, that movie. Well, it happened because um, Roger was very happy with my contribution to the Wild Angels, so he called me one day and he said, I'd like you to give you a chance to make your own movie. He says, now, Boris Karloff owes me two days' work. <laughs> what I want you to do is shoot 20 minutes with Karloff in two days. You can do that. I've shot whole pictures in two days. Now, I want you to take 20 minutes from a picture I made with Karloff some years ago, not a very good picture, called The Terror. Okay, wait a minute. So you, so you shot 20 minutes with Karloff? No, no, this, is, this, is, this was the proposal. Oh, okay, got it. 20 minutes with Karloff in two days. 20 minutes from an old Karloff picture. That's 40 minutes of Karloff. Then shoot with some other actors for 10 days, and I have a new 80-minute Karloff picture. Will you do it? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> had no idea what I was going to do with that. But it finally evolved with my wife at the time, Polly Platt. We, and I, we talked about it, and we talked out, finally figured out what to do. It was very tough, because the movie that we had to take footage from was really god-awful. <laughs> it was one of the worst movies ever made. I think. So really, you were just finding a way to use that 20 minutes that had already been shot? Well, we actually ended up not using 20 minutes. We must have used about six minutes. Well, we used it for under the main title, and we used it at the end, se the end sequence. So we didn't use any anywhere near 20 minutes. And we ended up with Boris for five days instead of two. And the idea for the film came from my editor at Esquire, Harold Hayes. He said, hey, buddy, you ought to do a picture about that guy in Texas when, when up to the University of Texas Tower and shot all those people. Top of the bell tower, and I thought right. to myself, I don't want to make a movie about that. Then later on, it was there in the back of my head, and then I was thinking, wait a minute, Karloff, we don't have to use that footage in the movie as part of the story. We can make him an actor. He's an actor. He's Boris Karloff, and he wants to quit being an actor. Why? Because his kind of horror isn't horrible anymore. Victorian horror is nothing compared to a sniper going out and shooting a bunch of people. My kind of horror isn't horror anymore. There they are. Look at that. No one's afraid of a painted monster. 
The only thing you've said that's right is about this. Which is why you ought to do my movie. You've had some big run-ins with studio people. A few. How has that affected your work? Oh, badly. <laughs> because you generally lose those fights. I had a really big fight at Universal with the guy who was there. He basically was sabotaging the movie for his own reasons. Which, which movie? A picture called Mask. Mask, with yes. Cher. Starring Cher and Eric Stoltz. And uh, I lost the battle. And I was very upset about it, and I sued the studio, which, by the way, is not a smart thing to do. <laughs> not a good career move. In the future, I'll make a note. Make a note of it. It's not a good career move. <laughs> so the picture went out the way they wanted it. I hated it. Everybody was going around saying it's a great picture, and I'm the one who's saying it's not as good as the picture I made. So I came out like a megalomaniac. And the actual dispute was over the music, right? It was, or part more of than it. More, it was uh, Bruce Springsteen. I had Bruce Springsteen at the time when nobody had him except me. And he had the biggest hit of, of all records ever done, which was Born in the USA. Sure. It was the top selling album ever. And I had him. I had five or six songs of his. Not, not just any songs, but the big ones. I had to take him out. I didn't take him out. They took him out behind my back and replaced him with Bob Seger, which was okay, but he's not Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> And then there was a question of two major sequences that added up to eight minutes, which also were not in, which I thought about. Well, anyway, I lost the battle. The picture did all right. Twenty years later, I was able to get it out on DVD in my version. Hmm. Bruce finally, very kindly, he and John Landau, I said, guys, can you help me? I really want to get that version out there on DVD. And they said, look, Peter, if it has to be for nothing, you can have it for nothing. So I told Universal, he'll give us the music for nothing. It got in, and I got the eight minutes in, too. Funny thing is, they said they junked all the stuff except the movie. So they didn't have those eight minutes. And I said, well, if, if you had a 35 millimeter print of those two sequences, couldn't we fix them for the, for, for, yeah, but we don't have them. I said, well, I have them. How do you happen to have them? Well, I stole them. <laughs> stole them. Aren't you happy I stole them? Yes, we're very happy you stole them. For $150,000, they fixed it, and it looks beautiful. You can't tell the difference. That is the story of a true auteur. How did you meet Dorothy Stratton? It was October of 78. I had played a quick visit to, the ma to Hefner's mansion in Holmby Hills. And as I was leaving, somebody introduced me to two young women. One was going to be 25th anniversary playmate, a brunette, and the other was blonde, who was going to be the playmate next year or something. And I thought that the blonde, whose name was Dorothy Stratton, was by far the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. Her hair hadn't been bleached yet. It was natural. She had just come to Hollywood within a couple of weeks. And, uh, well, I was completely floored by her looks. I said, I'm casting a movie. I'd love to see you for it, you know, which is a line, uh, <laughs> a pretty old line. But I was, in fact, going to cast the movie eventually. <laughs> and I gave her my name and number. She didn't call me. I found out much later that her friend told her, you don't want to call him. He's, you know, he's, he's a Lothario. A Lothario. I don't know if she used that word. It's, <laughs> it's a very a old school word. It's world, an old school word, word yeah. <laughs> Wolf, maybe, they meant. Uh, but anyway, she didn't call me. About a year later, by now, unfortunately, she was married. And they dyed her hair, and she'd been through hell. And I was, again, it was October, and I was paying a quick visit to the mansion. In fact, I told the fellow who dropped me off, I said, just, just come back in 15 minutes. I said, I don't want to stay long. I'm just going to say what I have to leave. And uh, I was walking through the ha ha entranceway, and I hear somebody call my name. And I turn around, and this blonde girl, bleach blonde girl, comes running up to me. I didn't recognize her until she got close. We talked for about an hour, and I just 
felt myself falling for her immediately. She was so sweet, sweetest girl I ever met. And I called my friend and said, don't pick me up. I'm going to be busy. And then I found out she was married, and then a lot of other things came out. And that was October, and I was making a movie at that point. Then you were actually casting a movie, right? Called They All Laughed. There was a small part in it that I thought she could play, and then I realized the part ought to be bigger. And I made the part bigger, and everybody who was working with me thought I was making the part bigger because I was falling in love with Dorothy which was half true and half not true. H half of it was that I felt it would help the picture because it would give John Ritter's character a happy ending. Will you marry me? Okay, I will. You will? Well, yes, after my divorce. That's how we met, and then we were pulled together by a force of love as which, as a kind of which I never felt. Or since. Is she the great love of your life? Yeah. I thought it was interesting that something in The Elephant Man spoke to Dorothy. That's why I made Mask. <clears throat> because when we were in New York, there was a double day on Fifth Double Day Bookshop on Fifth Avenue that stayed open till midnight. And we used to go down there after shooting sometimes. We went there one day and we were getting some books, and she picked up a book. A, a factual study of the Elephant Man, and she was riveted by this book. She, I saw she was poring over it, and I was doing something else. I came over and I looked over her shoulder. I saw what it was, and she was looking at these pictures. These pictures I couldn't look at. I said, "Are you interested in that?" She said, "Yes." I said, "Well, you, you, you sure you want to buy it?" "Yes." <laughs> and I said, "That was a definite yes." And um, so I bought it for her, and. Um, she read it cover to cover. She read very quickly and, and a lot. Then she went, first Broadway show, the only Broadway show she ever saw was a stage production of The Elephant Man. I can't remember which came first, but she went to see it. And uh, I, I wasn't able to go with her because I was cutting. And she loved it. <coughs> After she was killed, I came, I came back to New York and I saw The Elephant Man on stage. And I started to understand what she saw in it what it was that she identified with in some strange way. And that was the reason I made Mask, because we used to walk down the street in New York, and uh, she was not famous. The Playboy thing came out, but that's not what people, everybody stopped and looked at her. She was tall and strikingly beautiful. The, no photograph ever did justice to how she really looked. So everybody would stop and look at her. Dogs, I'm not kidding, dogs would stop <laughs> and look. And I said, everybody's looking at you, darling. She said, no, they're not. They're looking at you. I said, the only reason they're looking at me is to see who you're with. How does, how does that make you feel? She says, terrible. I said, why? She said, well, I feel like I have ice cream on my dress or something. She didn't have any consciousness of how beautiful she was. So I realized after she was killed and I was offered a mask, I thought, well, it's interesting because extreme ugliness or extreme beauty have the same effect on the person. They feel like an outsider. And so I thought I'd make it for Dorothy. Wow. That's an amazing story. That's a true story. And so where were you when you found out that she had been murdered? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I was at home. Having not heard from her all day, wondering where she'd been, thought she was pissed off at me or something. The phone rang about 11.20, and uh, it was Hefner. I thought she was over there complaining about me or something. And I got on the phone, and Hefner said, I said, hi, Hef, how's it going? He said, oh, haven't you heard? I heard what? He said, oh, Jesus, Dorothy's dead. <sighs> Lightning stroke. I got up, I remember I dropped the phone, and I fell to my knees, and, and I don't know what happened. How do you try to get over that? You don't get over it. You try to live with it. 
<clears throat> you learn to live with it. I had to cut the picture. We, we hadn't finished cutting the picture, so I had to look at her every day and try to cut the picture. It was tough. The picture uh, is, they all laughed. Yeah, and it's my favorite picture, too. That's one of my favorite pictures. It's my favorite picture. I think it's one of my best pictures, but it has a cult following. People like Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach and Quentin Tarantino. Quentin knows every line in the picture. <laughs> he put it on his top ten of all time. Wow. So it's kind of an underground cult picture. I, I, I'm very fond of it for obvious reasons. Audrey Hepburn was in it. Yeah, Audrey Hepburn, sure. How, how much of your fondness for the picture relates to Dorothy? Well, it was the happiest time of my life, making that movie. It was the, the most fulfilling, really, it was the peak of my life, really. This line here, this is your heart line. It shows you're very emotional. Emotions are terrific. Besides, nobody can help how they feel. We finished the picture and went to London for a couple of weeks together and then came back and had a couple of weeks and then she was murdered. But it was a, it was a, very few people can have the, have the experience that I had on that picture, the kind of inspiration and joy that it brought me. And that, and she was such an extraordinary human being that I'm really fortunate to have known her. A few years after, you, married her younger sister. Yeah. Well, Louise and I were, uh, we, we described it like a shipwreck. We were both on a shipwreck, and we ended up hanging on to the same piece of driftwood, so we sort of saved each other from drowning. And then we sort of, you know, it sort of naturally followed that our friendship became a romantic one, and then developed like that. And you, you married? We were married for 15 years, yeah. So if somebody comes along and says, Peter Bogdanovich, you've got carte blanche, you can make any movie you want to, what kind of movie do you make today? Well, I'm about to make a screwball comedy in New York called Squirrels to the Nuts. <laughs> it, with that title, it better be a comedy. Yes. And uh, it's about a theater director who has a strange pension. He's married, but he has a strange pension for ordering up escorts, and then he pays them to not be escorts anymore, to get out of the business. This gets him in a lot of trouble, as it turns out, with this one escort who's being followed by a detective. Sounds like it's got some, some echoes of, uh, of What's Up Doc. It's kind of a cross between What's Up Doc and They All Laughed, but it's edgier because it's got, it was about an escort, so it has a sexual overtone, that, although there's nothing explicit about it. It's funny. It's a funny script. We've had it for a couple of years. We rewrote it a lot because it was originally written for John Ritter. Wow. When John died, uh, I sort of put it on the back burner for a long time because it's hard to find anybody. And then I have a ghost picture I want to make. Uh, which I think could be the best picture I've ever made. It's called Wait For Me. And it's not a scary ghost picture. It's a funny, sad ghost picture. All the ghosts are very friendly. Uh, and it's very personal. And it's about a movie director. It isn't me, but it could be. Well, if there is a, uh, a new Peter Bogdanovich movie, I will be the first guy in line. Well, that'd be nice. We'll, you'll get, we got, we'll get about dishes, I think. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. I really Steve, appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure speaking with you. Nice to speak to you. Thank you.